Are you happy? Right now, are you happy? This one mom said that she knows it's going to be a good day when all the wheels on her cart are moving in the right direction. There's a Chinese proverb that says if you wish to be happy for three days, get married. If you wish to be happy for eight days, kill your pig and eat it. If you want to be happy for a lifetime, learn to fish. Tonight is my annual sermon on one of the fruit of the Spirit. And it's on joy. It's on joy. The noun joy is used 59 times in the New Testament. The first time in the New Testament is in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 10 when the wise men see the star in the east and they come and they rejoice with exceeding joy as they worship Jesus. The last time the word is used in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 8, the women who hear the news that Jesus is risen from the dead run with great joy to announce to the apostles the resurrection of the dead. Luke uses the word eight times. John uses it about the same number of times, nine times. Paul, of course, uses it more than anybody else, 21 times. The fruit of the Spirit is the only time Paul uses it in the letter of Galatians. Galatians doesn't have a lot of stuff in it that's joyful because he has to critique some false doctrine there. But Paul uses the word in 2 Corinthians five times, the same number of times he uses it in Philippians. Now we tend to associate Philippians with joy, and yet Paul uses it in 2 Corinthians as much as he does in Philippians. Look at Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen Christ, yet you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. True joy, of course, comes from our relationship to Jesus Christ. I also like 3 John, verse 4. So much so that Rachel painted this verse on a sign and we stuck it on the wall going down the steps or up the steps in Kentucky so that our girls would see it every day. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Joy. The verb is used 74 times in the New Testament. Again, it was used for the first time in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10. Rejoice with great joy being able to worship Jesus. Luke uses the verb a dozen times in his gospel, seven times in Acts, so he likes to use that verb. John uses it nine times in his gospel account. Paul uses it eight times in 2 Corinthians. Paul finds a lot of joy in what he writes in 2 Corinthians. He uses it nine times in the four chapters in Philippians. The last time the verb is used in the New Testament is in the words of the Apostle John in Revelation 19 and verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. So I get my PowerPoints from a company called Igniter Media. 
And so I'm looking for PowerPoints to use for joy. So I type in joy in the search bar. A lot of different images come up. This one comes up associated with Isaiah chapter 35. That's the whole reason why we're studying Isaiah 35 tonight. I didn't know where I was going with it until I read Isaiah 35. So open your copy of God's Word to Isaiah 35 and let's see what Isaiah has to say about joy. Because he has something to teach us about joy. Isaiah lived at a time when Assyria was invading Israel, 700s B.C. The northern Israel, uh, the capital Samaria will fall in 722 B.C. But it's also during that period of time when the Assyrians are knocking on the door of the capital of Jerusalem and they want to invade Jerusalem. Now, King Hezekiah has not yet prayed to God for deliverance. God has not yet sent his angel to kill 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers. That's not happened yet. That's in chapter 37. So the period is, is pretty dark right now in Isaiah's time. In chapter 34, Isaiah critiques the nations around Israel, including, of course, the Assyrians. Look at chapter 34, verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Draw near, O nations, to hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all it contains here, and the world and all that springs from it, from, for the Lord's indignation is against the nations, all the nations, and His wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. Drop down to verse 8 and notice that this vengeance is for the sake of Israel. So, chapter 34 is a, a description of God's wrath on the nations, including Assyria. In light of that, then, chapter 35 turns to the joy that is available to Israel. Even though they are on the verge of being overran by the Assyrians. So here's where I want us to feed our spirits tonight. <clears throat> Basically, through these ten verses, Isaiah, and, and most of Isaiah's poetry, which is oftentimes set off in your, your translation in parag short paragraph form, that indicates that it's poetry in the Hebrew language. So through this poem, Isaiah will jump back and forth between a description of physical blessings with a description of spiritual blessings. So generally speaking, the odd verses are physical descriptions. The even verses are spiritual descriptions. So verses 1 and 2, he says, Israel will be blessed. Look at what he says and notice the use of the physical imagery. The wilderness and the desert will be glad and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely with re and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Lebanon was the, the area of Israel along the coast of the Mediterranean. Of course, if it's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, it's going to be gorgeous. Well, uh, olive trees, um, uh, other uh, abundant plant life. Carmel literally translates the Garden of God. So it also was known for its luxuriant uh, forest and trees, flowers. Sharon, of course, you probably recognize the Rose of Sharon, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. It seems like Sharon, which was in the southern part of, of Israel, Sharon had an exotic imagery in the Jewish mind, much like Hawaii does for Americans probably. So Isaiah has just described the destruction of the other nations in chapter 34. And then in chapter 35, he says, when it comes to Israel... They're going to be glad. And they're going to rejoice. Isaiah uses the verb 11 times to rejoice. Incidentally, Psalms uses it 19 times. A book of songs that rejoice. This is re this related noun here for rejoicing. Notice verse 2. It will rejoice with rejoicing. That verb is only used twice and it's only used by Isaiah the shout of joy here is used 34 time, 54 times rather in the Old Testament. Shout with joy. 
extensively used in the book of Psalms, as we would expect, 14 times by Isaiah. So these different parts of Israel are going to rejoice and shout with joy. Look at Isaiah's use of the word in Isaiah 12 and verse 6. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. Notice, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Why does Isaiah tell Israel to rejoice? Because God is among you. Even though Assyria is trying to invade and Assyria is hauling off half of our country, rejoice because God is among your presence. Isn't that a message for Christians? Didn't Jesus say that exact same thing in Matthew 28 and verse 20? I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so these different parts of Israel that he mentioned, uh, the Arabah, Lebanon, Carmel, Sharon, they're going to see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. We're going to get to how and when they see that in just a moment. So the first point Isaiah makes is that Israel is going to be blessed. The second point he makes in verses 3 and 4 is that even the weak are going to be blessed. It's not this ble These blessings are not just for the strong, not just for the healthy, not just for the, uh, the leaders. Everybody. Verse 3, encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but He will save you. This word for encourage in the Hebrew language is the verb form of the noun for strength. So the word encourage here in Hebrew means to strengthen. Strengthen those who are exhausted who are worn out, who have been losing their homes, who have been losing their fields, who may have been even losing their family and their friends to the Assyrians. Maybe even their faith in God is exhausted. Maybe you know some Christian family members who have gone through so much in their life that their faith is exhausted. Isaiah says, strengthen them. Encourage them. Notice he says, strengthen the feeble. This word for strengthen is related to the Hebrew noun, truth. Which means this word for strengthen means to establish. It means to put a foundation under the feeble. Those who have trouble standing. Maybe not physically, but have trouble standing emotionally. Maybe psychologically. Maybe spiritually. Strengthen them. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to Christians. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. That sounds like what Isaiah is saying here, right? And then in verse 15, Paul says, See that no one returns evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good, one for another and for all people. Don't return evil for evil. Okay, look back here at chapter 35. And notice at the end of that verse 6, excuse me, verse 4. Isaiah says, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but He will save you. Don't take vengeance in your own hands. Let God take care of it. We could be a whole lot happier if we didn't get concerned about what everybody else is doing. Just focus on what we're doing in our relationship with God. Back to verse 4. Say to those with anxious hearts, those who are worrying and those who are fretting, those who are anxious, say to those who are anxious, take courage. That's the same verb that's used in verse 3 for encourage. Same verb. Strengthen them and fear not. That expression, fear not, in the Old Testament is used 78 times. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. So the sermon last Sunday night was on the power of God. Do not 
fear. So in this context, Isaiah is encouraging God's people not to fear, but rather to rejoice and to shout for joy because of the blessings that come. So there's going to be a blessing, and the blessing is going to involve also those who are weak. It's for the weak. But in verses 5 and 6, Isaiah sees down through the corridors of time, and he sees the Messiah coming. And this joy is wrapped up in the coming of the Messiah. Verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. Do you recall somebody being born blind in the Old Testament and being healed? There's somebody who was struck blind and then healed, but not born blind. Was there anybody who was born deaf that was healed in the Old Testament? No. That's a job for the Messiah. The Messiah is going to bring these blessings for God's people. And I know these two verses are messianic because Jesus tells us so. Matthew chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. That's the occasion where John is in prison and he's discouraged. He's one of those feeble. He's one of those with anxious heart at that point. And so he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask him, Are you the one who is coming or should we look for another? Jesus said, you go back and you tell John that Isaiah 35 verses 5 and 6 is being fulfilled in your very eyes. Jesus came to fulfill that imagery of providing blessings from God. The lame will leap like a deer. That's one of the most enjoyable accounts to read in the life of Christ. The miracles that he performs when he raises, when he heals those that were lame. When the man was healed uh, that was lame in Acts chapter uh, 3 by Peter and John, they jump up. They're excited because their body is healed. The tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. God created man to praise him. One day everybody will praise God. Even those who are deaf and mute will be able to praise God with their voices because of the Messiah. The Messiah will come and He will bless Israel. In verses 7 and 8, Isaiah is still thinking of that Messiah and he shows us that the Messiah is the highway to holiness. I think I've mentioned before, I would like to sometime drive the length of Route 66. When we went to New Hampshire a couple of weeks ago, we come into the airport, we're renting a car, we get to the checkout desk and they say, well, you've got some options. I've got a free upgrade. One of the options was a Dodge Charger. I have never driven an eight-cylinder for very long in my life. I get that thing out of the airport, I get up there on the highway and the speed limit sign says 55. Now, this car wasn't designed to drive 55. I was so glad when the state speed limit said 70. That's what that car is designed to drive. On the highway, on the open highway, get out and go. Hit your destination. Look at what Isaiah says about the highway. Beginning in verse 7, the scorched land. Remember, he's described the, the curses of God on the pagan nations in chapter 34. And a lot of that is described as a desert. Which means God's going to remove the blessings. Here in verse 7, God says that scorched land that you look around and see because of the Assyrian invasion, and this is metaphor, it's going to become a pool of water. And the thirsty ground is going to become springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, you're going to find a resting place. Not a place with wild animals, a place for you to rest as a human being. And the grass is, become, is going to become reeds and rushes. Cane reed that gives you spices and rushes that is papyrus. It's going to be useful. Not weeds. Flowers. Vegetables. That's the idea. And then in verse 8. A highway will be there. A roadway. 
and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. That first word translated highway there in verse 8, it's, it's the only time in the whole Old Testament that word is used. But the next word, roadway, which is also translated highway in the phrase highway of holiness, that's just a generic word for way or path. It's used 700 times in the Old Testament, but Isaiah uses the word 47 times. That's, that's Isaiah's Route 66. Isaiah's highway is the Messiah. And it's the highway that leads to holiness. Remember, his people are being invaded by Assyria because of their sins. Primarily idolatry, but idolatry leads to a host of other sins. So they're being invaded because of idolatry, but Isaiah says there is a highway that leads to holiness. And it is the Messiah. He's going to pick up on that idea in Isaiah 40 verse 3. You recognize the verse. Clear the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah preached around 700 B.C. Malachi comes along around 400 B.C., 300, 250, 300 years later. Malachi picks up on that imagery of the way and moves it forward. Look at Malachi's words in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, God says, I am going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you lie. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. We recognize those two verses as being fulfilled in John the baptizer, the forerunner of Jesus the Christ. And Mark tells us that, Mark 1, verses 2 and 3. So who is the highway of holiness? It's Jesus Christ. Isn't that what he meant when he said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way? He's picking up that imagery from Isaiah. That's Isaiah talking. Jesus is the way. And so united together are Christians and the church with Jesus Christ that one of the designations in the New Testament for the church is the way. The verses from the book of Acts are on the screen. The church is the highway of holiness. Because the church is the body of Christ on earth. And so that's the reason why Jesus could tell Saul of Tarsus, even though he was persecuting Christians, Jesus says, you're persecuting me. And so Isaiah says there's going to be a highway of holiness. And notice back in Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 8, he says the unclean will not travel on it. If I had that Dodge Charger on Route 66, I wouldn't want to have any, anything in my way, including traffic lights and stop signs or speed limits. <laughs> Isaiah says there's not going to be anything unclean on this path to holiness. Direct line, straight to God. It will be for him who walks that way. Isaiah uses the word holy 23 times. Isaiah was concerned about his people being right with God. Fools will not wander on that path. So Israel is going to be blessed, including those who are weak, through Jesus Christ, who is the highway of holiness to Jehovah God. And it's a highway of joy. Look at verses 9 and 10. No lion will be there. My understanding is at that period of time, David refers to lions several times. Lions were pretty widespread around uh, uh, Israel uh, during those days. Nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there. So there's not going to be any danger in this path. That's what the lion and the wild beast symbolize. It symbolize danger. But there's not going to be anything there. Rather, the redeemed will walk there. The redeemed. Jacob said in G Genesis chapter 48 and verse 16 that the angel of the Lord had redeemed him from all evil. But the theology behind the idea of redemption really comes out of the Exodus. 
In Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, God tells Moses that he is going to redeem Israel out of Egypt with an outstretched harm and mighty deeds. We studied last week in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 13 that God redeemed Israel out of Egypt. He paid the price to bring them out of Israel and be His people. That physical redemption out of Egypt is a metaphor for our redemption out of a worse slavery, that is a slavery of sin. And so the Apostle Paul comes along and he tells the Jews that Christ redeemed them from the curse of the law, Galatians 3 and verse 13, chapter 4 and verse 5. In fact, Paul says that all, everybody is redeemed from our lawless deeds through the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Peter says we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. So you and I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Ephesians 1 and verse 7. I appreciate Dana leading us in that song, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed and so happy in Jesus, His child and forever I am. The redemption still awaits us in heaven, awaits our, our consummation of redemption awaits us in heaven, Ephesians 4 and verse 30, but that redemption is going to be eternal. It's going to be permanent. Hebrews 9 and verse 12. Back to Isaiah's song in Isaiah chapter 35, notice in verse 10, the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Once again, the background of the concept of ransom is found in the Exodus. Exodus chapter 13, verses 13 through 15, God says, God, God chose not to take the life of the firstborn of the Israelites... He did take the life of the firstborn of the Egyptians. But he says, because I spared your sons, I have ransomed them. And so they belong to me. That's the theological background of that idea of ransom. But then it's a metaphor for the ransom that we have in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10, uh, 20 and verse 28, Mark 10 and verse 45, Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Christ gave Himself up for us as a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 6. The highway of holiness is walked by those who are redeemed and by those who are ransomed. All by the blood of Christ. That's the reason why we need to be joyful. That's the reason why we need to be glad. Look back at Isaiah 35 and verse 10. Come with joyful shouting to Zion. Joyful shouting. In the Hebrew language is actually two words. In song and in joy. But there's a figure of speech called a hindiatus in which you can actually join two nouns together to convey one idea. And so that's why it's translated as joyful shouting. Joyful shouting. Come to Jesus Christ with joyful shouting. Notice Isaiah also portrays this joy as being everlasting. Everlasting joy upon their heads. We are not anointed with oil like the priest were. We are anointed with joy. Because we've been washed clean from our sins through the blood of Christ. That's the hope Isaiah was holding out for his people. The highway to holiness is the highway of joy. They will find gladness and joy. And notice at the end of that song, he says, Sorrow and sighing will flee away. From a spiritual perspective, there's no mourning, there's no loss, there's no sighing and sorrow in Jesus Christ. It's a life of joy. It's a life of blessings. 
Nehemiah lived roughly the same time as Malachi. Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 8 and verse 10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When we find our joy in our relationship with Jesus Christ, that is a strength that we have to endure life, to endure what Satan throws at us. So Isaiah's message to his people would be his same message for us today. Blessings come from God for everybody. And those blessings are found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The highway to God and holiness. And it's a highway of joy. So let's find joy in our relationship with Christ. And let's make sure that joy that we feel in our hearts comes out in our behavior and how we deal with people and the expressions on our faces. Let's let people see the joy that reigns in our hearts because we're saved in Jesus Christ. And when you're saved from your sins, everything else is insignificant. That's a matter of joy. If you need our encouragement tonight, if you need the prayers of the elders tonight, if you need to obey the gospel tonight, let us know if we can do something to help you on your walk of the highway of holiness while we stand and sing together. In the desert of sorrow and sin, Lord, make us a journey of with the Lord.